right now we're sitting at about 35% of the US workforce working remotely. Within the next five years, I would probably say we'll be back up to about 50%. So maximum amount of remote work positions that are available in terms of a percentage of the population. McKinsey did a huge report on it, and they said about 67% of the U.S. workforce can currently work remotely. Liam, welcome back to the show, man. This is uh, super fun. I am so happy to have you back on here. You know, the last time you were on this podcast, was episode 26. Oh, wow. And we are at like 160 some odd episodes now. So it's been it's been too long, man. That's awesome. Congratulations, by the way, on all Thank of those you. episodes. Um, I think Thank you're you. doing Thank fantastic you. work, not only for digital nomadism, but remote work in general, getting the word out to a ton of different people. And I couldn't not take the opportunity to chat with you because over the last couple of years, you've really gained a voice and i think a lot of people pay attention to you about where remote work and well, digital nomadism you. is going you're you're making me blush now we were talking about how sick your lighting is and now my bag bad lighting and i'm going to be blushing it's going to be it's going to be a mess but i want to say congratulations to you as well because uh, you guys just released your book running remote so congratulations on that i've been reading it i haven't finished it yet i haven't finished it yet i'm about 55 percent of the way there but okay I wanted to start off with this. Yeah. Um, so obviously, uh, you and Rob, who's been on the podcast here before, actually not not too long ago, you have Time Doctor already. Yep. So you're already doing a lot of work in in remote. Yep. You have the running remote conference. You have the uh, the community that goes along with it, and now you've written the book. Why was why was the next part of that writing the book? Why did you decide to do it? Uh, you know, what was the, what was the, the goal with that? Sure. So first off, I think we've got to kind of go back in time to explain that, go back to about March of 2020. So everyone knows what happened in February of 2020, which is the literal shit hit the fan. The world completely changed from a statistical perspective. 4% of the U S workforce was working remotely in February of 2020. And by March, 45% of the U S workforce was working remotely. So wild. That is the biggest transition in work since the industrial revolution, but the industrial revolution took 80 years and we did that in March. So a complete change of everything that you could possibly think of as it applies to work occurred. And during that time, and you probably know this too, because you were, an active participant of this ecosystem pre-pandemic, there were, I mean, a big customer or, you know, a, a person that wanted to kind of talk to me, maybe if they were like 200 people, 300 people, that would be someone that would be important. And in March, I was getting uh, phone calls from like G20 countries that are like, hey, we have 50, 550,000 employees and we need to take them remote today. Uh, how do we do that? And I was like, I have no idea. We have 150 people. And their response was, you're the first person that we've been able to get on the line. So there was such a massive information gap at that point. Everyone on planet Earth wanted to know what 800 people at the last running remote knew, which was how yeah. to actually build and scale legit large businesses remotely. And I felt like I had a, um, what are those little rings on ships that you throw it to people? Life preservers. Buoys? Yeah, yeah. Like I felt like I had this magic life preserver and I could save these companies. I could save these people, but I could only do it one at a time. Really, it required like five or six hours for me to sit down with one of these companies and try to show them what they needed to do to be able to work remotely. So all I did was I liquidated all of that knowledge of me interviewing hundreds of you know, seven, eight, and nine figure remote first founders and operators figuring out what they do that everyone else doesn't do and basically putting that into a book. So now I don't have to actually tell someone, hey, here's how you do X, Y, Z. I can literally just give them the book and then I can say, if you've got any questions after that, let me know. I think the, the book actually was interesting because I feel like, especially in this, uh, like you said, you know, we essentially made a huge change 
in a month or two that, you know, in the industrial revolution took like 80 years. And one of the things I think that happens when you try to change that quickly is there's a whole bunch of different ways of doing things, right? So when you talk with like other remote leaders, they might have one way of doing it. Other people might have a different one. So I was very curious to pick up the book and see if, you know, like a lot of my ideas agreed with your ideas and so on and so forth. And I think you guys nailed it. Like, actually, like I was like, oh, I'm so happy they talked about this. And I'm so happy they laid things out like that. But the one thing I will say that um, you did a very good job of talking about and also pointing out how important it is that I don't think I've seen elsewhere is internal analytics. Uh, and and specifically this idea of how to measure what's happening inside the company and how important that is. So, A, can you kind of talk a little bit of that, like briefly explain what internal analytics are and why they're important? And then one of the things that I almost wanted to expand on from the book is how do you do that? Like, what is a good way of actually putting that in place? Are there any sort of like tools or software that you're using for that? I know that you have some templates in the book, but what are some like tools that you use in order to to do that or other tools that maybe others should check out? Yeah. So one of the things that we thought about when we wrote the book is, and you may notice this, and we've been critiqued actually, I had a very bad Amazon review. Um, but a one-star <laughs> Amazon review, and this guy. Now you're an author. You yeah, can't yeah. be. You can't be an author without a bad Amazon. Well, it review. was. It was a. It was like a two-page Amazon review. It was pretty good. Um, <laughs> and and it looked like you, you know this individual had read the entire book and gone through it from top to bottom, and his critique was, well, you don't have many tactics. You you have a lot of theoretical frameworks, but you don't have many tactics, and that was actually purposeful, uh, because just before we jumped on, we were talking about how maybe we're going to be working in the metaverse in the next 10 years. So the actual tactics are going to change, but the fundamental basis remains the same. And one fundamental basis of remote work is measurement. Uh, You need to be able to have measurement inside of a remote asynchronous organization. Otherwise, you're going to fundamentally fail. And the reason being is when you're in an office you have eyes on people and presence is not necessarily equal productivity or even work, right? So just because someone's in the office doesn't necessarily mean that they're working, but your feedback loop actually becomes a lot faster. When you have workers in 43 different countries all over the world, like we do, it's very difficult to be able to get that feedback. So we identify every single company needs a quantifiable longitudinal metric that they are answerable for. So they can uniquely move that particular number. And more importantly, they are measured by that number. And we take all of that information, we put it on a dashboard, and we give access to everyone else in the company that information. So like everyone else in the company will know how much money we're generating, how many leads we're getting into the website. We call it our version of radical transparency inside of the organization so that everyone knows what everyone else is doing. And we effectively want everyone to have the same informational advantage as the CEO. And in an on-premise company, in an office, you wouldn't be able to do that, particularly if it's not asynchronous. But when you can have an asynchronous organization operate in the way that we do, since everything is documented and written down and is digitized, Everyone can have access to that information. It's very difficult for a CEO to be able to kind of like accept that because I know a lot of them want to be able to protect that information. But once you empower everyone to have the same information as you do, amazing things happen inside of the company. Number one, they become a lot more autonomous. They actually do the right, they make the right decisions on problems because they have the same information that you do. Number two, when you need to make difficult decisions, the vast majority of the time, everyone agrees with it because they have the same information that you do and they've come to the same conclusion. And if they don't, then you need to take a really good second look at that, at that decision and figure out, oh man, maybe I was completely wrong and maybe I should actually reverse that particular decision. So generally for us, uh, it's this premise of radical transparency is the core piece that really differentiates most other on-premise or unsuccessful remote companies from successful remote organizations, uh, at least in the research that I've done. Yeah. And I think this idea of like ownership uh, is very important. Like one of the things that I've talked about before and that I worked with clients is 
creating documentation and SOPs and handbooks, I think, is like pretty widely accepted now as like something that you need if you're gonna run a company remotely. But I think ownership of parts of that documentation to specific people is really important. And I think that that would be the same for like these internal analytics, right? Like every person you own this, 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 this part of the handbook. And then you also own this part of the analytics, right? Like this is like your, your statistic to drive, right? Is that kind of like how you're absolutely out responsibility? Well, and more importantly, it creates the number is a third party. So a lot of the times inside of companies, it's kind of like the manager versus the employee, but there's the manager versus the employee, but then, or, well, there's the manager, there's the employee, and then there's this third variable, which is the actual metrics that the employee is completely empowered to move, never give someone a number to own unless they can actually move it and change it and create impact on it. And obviously that's never perfect, but generally this is something that the employee and the manager should come to agreement on to be able to say, yeah, I can move that number. Um, and there's lots of conversations that I can have with some of my direct reports saying, numbers don't look good, <laughs> right? Like what, what can I do to be able to make sure that we're moving these numbers? And it's not a, it's not a combative process. It's a process of, we know that this number is not hitting where we need it to hit. Um, what can I do to be able to help you? to be able to, to make that successful. And that's a big differentiator. Uh, a lot of the times people are afraid to be able to submit those numbers to their managers because then they think they're going to get fired. Um, inside of asynchronous organizations, the numbers are automatically populated. Uh, so, you know, all of the numbers that we have, 90% of them just automatically pop up on our dashboard. So it's not an issue of, oh, okay, is this number right? How is it interpreted? You know, maybe this person kind of played with the numbers a little bit. No, it's black and white. It's right there. And uh, if you're not doing well, we've got to be able to make a course adjustment as quickly as possible. So let's uh, very quickly uh, appease, I think would be the right word to use here, the negative uh, reviewer of, of the book. So I know that the book, you, you wanted to to write Fuck out the that framework. Guy. Whatever. That, that, like, that guy... <laughs> I got I'll, one I'll bad them, review. Everyone else review. is five stars. That one fucking asshole gives me a one star review and pulls down my overall star rating. Now, if you're uh, listening to this podcast right now, please do me a huge favor. Go to the Amazon review and give me a five star. So I can, I think I'm like a 4.8 right now. If I can get up to like yeah. a 4.9, that would be amazing. It really actually is pretty important for the overall algorithm. It's the same thing with podcasting. It's crazy how much reviews, even to this day, are like actually help a podcast grow, mm -hmm. which I guess makes a lot of sense. Mm. But it's like makes a huge difference to actually how popular you are in uh in like the the charts. It's crazy. Yeah. Well, the thing that I find very frustrating, to be honest with you, is in chapter two, I discuss the actual mindset that we're going into. I'm like, there are you're not going to hear about Zoom. You're not going to hear about Slack. You're not going to hear about Microsoft Teams. This is a theoretical framework. If you want to go find a book about that, there are thousands, well, not thousands, there are hundreds of them that you can go and pick up about what tools to use for remote work. The one thing that no one was really talking about, and I think we're the first book on the subject, is the operating system of remote, which I'm calling asynchronous management um, yeah. because that's really kind of been the basis of what all of these remote pioneers have used to be able to build companies. And the funny thing is I was speaking at um, Nacho Rodriguez's uh, conference in the Canary Islands. Yep. And, you know, there's like 500 people there and I'm giving this presentation on asynchronous work. And uh, this was about a year before the book was launched, but I was right in the middle of writing it. And it was on asynchronous work and like half the people gave me this look of like, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> and then I had this moment of like, oh shit, no one knows what the hell this is about. And, I, yeah. and I've invested a year of my life into writing something that no one knows, you know, that has, has one inkling about. And it was at a conference about remote work and digital nomadism. So I had, I had a moment of fear there, but I think that. Uh, that just goes to show you that 
This is a concept that not many people know about, but it is the single most important thing that remote yeah. companies have used to become small remote companies have used to become big remote companies. Well, and this and this kind of drives so I this kind of drives a big issue that I think has happened in remote work post COVID is that companies didn't actually learn how to work remotely and are using Zoom as like this duct Crutch. tape to 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 keep them to keep the company running and being managed the same way that it was before without actually doing the underlying under the hood work in order to run the company well. Like I'll give you an example. Um, when we were in Mexico, we had a friend come visit and and she told me that they had done an eight hour Zoom meeting with over 50 people. Holy in shit. Their company. And she said this as like, and I understand where she's coming from because she's like, you know, I'm very proud of that, that I was able to like manage that thing. And there's a part of me that was like, I'm, I'm happy that you're proud, but you shouldn't have had to do that. Like, that's crazy. That's not like good remote work operations. And I think so many companies, even though they're like remote work friendly now, have yet to do that underlying work yeah. to make those, you know, like under the hood changes. Well, you hit the nail on the head. Um, Darren Murph, who we interviewed for the book, who's the head of remote at GitLab, has this great saying, which is they've turned working from home into living at work. And really that's, that's the reality that we're currently, that we currently have. I love the division of working from home versus remote work because the media was using this term working from home initially, and they still do. But when I, umbrella, yeah, but I think working from home is those eight hour zoom calls. Like no one should be on an eight hour zoom call ever. Right. Ever, if if you are on a four hour Zoom call, that is a red flag that your company is going to fall apart, and you're probably going to go back to the office. The other red flag: tracking mouse movements or like keypads. That's the other thing that when I hear that, it just drives me insane. Yeah, I it makes think me so angry. To me, when you look at the input versus output data, you have to be able to. And at least for me, I'm not against collecting information. I just want to be able to figure out what people are doing with it. So if you can actually tell me, oh yeah, okay, well, I'm doing this to be able to figure out um, how efficiently you can do a particular task and here's your own data and here are the things that you want to be able to change inside of that data, go ahead, do it. But when you are just measuring it just simply for the purposes of, of measuring it, like there's no actual outcome variable, it doesn't, it doesn't work. Um, but I, I completely agree with you when you think about these eight hour Zoom calls. Like, so just to kind of give you context, uh, I work about 40 hours per week outside of doing podcasts like this. I do about three to four hours of Zoom calls. So we actually try to keep everyone within 10% synchronous um, of their of their work week. And I'm an executive inside of the company. So any and I would say anyone that goes above that amount is effectively wasting time um, because the vast majority of that communication can actually be handled asynchronously through project management systems, Slack communications, um, email communications. And I think that it's this old school premise of, well, if I see you, then I know that you're working, but there's a difference between being busy and being productive. And unfortunately we're just measuring a lot of busyness instead of actual productivity. Oh, that's, that's so true. Yeah. And especially now with like one of the rules that I try to do is like, let's go through everything, every other medium possible and then get on a zoom call. Right. Like, so, okay. Is Slack not working? Great. Send me uh record this in loom and send it to me. And like, let's discuss it and then kind of go through it. And then like zoom is like the last, the last option, you know, that, that we have, if, if we really can't, if we really can't figure it out. Yeah, I have the same, and it's in, I can't remember where it is in the book, but I have kind of my communication pyramid, which is in-person versus video, video versus audio, audio versus instant messaging and instant messaging versus email and project management. So your base of the pyramid should be email and project management. Then you should be going to things like instant messaging, then to audio, then to video, then to in-person. If I could communicate with everyone in person across the 140 plus countries that we have team members in, that would be great. Or, sorry, 43 countries that we, we have 140 people, 43 countries. The 43 countries, that would be fantastic. But the reality is that 
I can get much more efficiency uh, and have much a much higher level of freedom and scale by building a remote first company. So you sacrifice some of that immediacy in terms of communication in exchange for the ability to scale your business much faster than you could before. Because that's really what asynchronous management is all about. It's about scaling. It's about being able to have the framework, the SOPs, the process management systems to be able to say, yeah, I can scale to 10,000 people if I really want to from 100 in you know six months. That is achievable if you have the right systems in place. It's not achievable if you continue to work on the same synchronous model that the vast majority of workers have had since uh, the 1800s. Well, and this is why it's funny because, you know, earlier on you said that I was like uh, in in the remote workspace or in the async space like uh, earlier than a lot of other people. And the interesting thing there is that I actually wasn't, what I was really interested in at the time was lifestyle business. And that made a very interesting shift into remote work because actually lifestyle business owners were the ones that had figured out a lot of this async stuff first because they wanted to go off and travel and do whatever else they wanted to do and they wanted their business to run on autopilot right so a lot of the og books actually that i read that taught me a lot about like how to do sops and all that kind of stuff were actually like lifestyle business focused books that were like hey here's how to automate your business with like vas and processes so that you can go hang out and do and do other stuff and i think that that's a very funny thing that some of those people are the ones that figured it figured it out. But I want to touch on something uh, that, that that you made a, a big point of in the book, which is that in many ways the office was really like an extrovert's playground because a lot of the people who would get promotions were the ones that you know knew how to say the nice things and they were extroverted and they you know kind of like w- were very good at that. While introverts who can do a really good job, but maybe weren't so good at like pandering to the boss, didn't get those those promotions. And you kind of talked about how remote work is for the introvert. Like that's who's going to win in a remote work setting. As an extrovert, how can we use our skills, what we are as extroverts best at to also win in a remote work setting? I wouldn't necessarily say introverts win and extroverts lose. I would say that extroverts historically have had a huge advantage and now it's an equal playing field. So I think about it just generally in terms of the adoption of good ideas. So 10 people go into a meeting and (laughs) maybe some people have great ideas. Maybe some people have horrible ideas, but before the levering factor was, am I charismatic? Can I communicate those ideas effectively? Can I convince other people of the quality of that idea. And if I can, then I can have my idea adopted more often than someone who can't communicate that information. The wrapper around that idea is around an introverted wallflower guy that's sitting in the back that doesn't really want to actually discuss the, you know, the details or debate those details with someone who really is just better suited to be able to to communicate those ideas. So When I think about asynchronous communication and management, it's much more focused on like those wrappers fall away, right? The charisma is not necessarily as applicable as it was inside of that physical office. So the the successful idea adoption rate, I would argue, goes up. Now, it's incredibly difficult to be able to identify what's a good idea versus a bad idea. But generally, it allows for the transmission of information in a format that both introverts and extroverts have an equal playing field. And at the end of the day, if the extrovert, even well, if the extrovert is the business owner, that's hugely advantageous towards that extroverted business owner because they know that more ideas will be adopted um, in a better way inside of their organization. I suppose if you're a middle manager inside of the company, it might be a disadvantage. But again, I think everyone's a lot more interested in better ideas being d- adopted more often, regardless of where you are in the company. Yeah, and I think like like one of the things that I keep saying is in terms of like extrovert versus introvert is one of the things is like, I think the resume is dead and the people who are going to get the best jobs are the ones that they can like, they they have proof of work in that space, right? So like 
start a podcast, make a YouTube channel where you talk about this subject, like interview some of the, uh, you know, subject matter experts in, in order to like kind of gain some ground, um, in terms of, uh, you know, like I have some sort of credibility in this space. And I think that's where extroverts are really good. The same way that like introverts have like, like for them, like proof of work is, is phenomenal. You know, when you think about, um, you know, like, like things like GitLab or GitHub or whatever it may be where you can literally see all the work that you've done. And like, Hey, that's our man, because it doesn't matter, you know, that the, they don't do these sort of things. Their work is, is really phenomenal and, and it's on there. Yep. So, I mean, we measure our engineers. The first pass when we want to look for people is their GitHub repos or their GitLab repos, um, because nothing else matters than that. Before we hit record, we just talked about how the future of project management is sort of, you know, bundling that into this because then it's amazing where you can literally say, okay, we're inside of a project management uh, operating system, and it, like this is the person for it, right? Like it's it's uh, it, it's phenom phenomenal for that. So I want to shift over into a quote that I thought was very interesting in the book. You kind of started out with this quote, which is from uh, Mark Andreessen, and the quote is. Um, that remote work may be a permanent civilization shift, a consequence of the internet that's maybe even more important than the internet itself. This is something that we've talked about on the podcast before, and it's something that actually you mentioned Darren Murph. Uh, it, when he was on the podcast, we talked about how remote work in many ways is the first domino that falls of a much longer chain of dominoes. Uh, can you talk a little bit about that in terms of like in your you know, opinion, if you agree with the Mark Andreessen quote, what are the next dominoes in that series of dominoes? Well, I think the very next one is work automation. And we're seeing that already with the great resignation. We're effectively at two and a half percent unemployment rate in the United States. Um, Europe is seeing close to those same numbers. And there is a huge challenge right now. Like I've just used, um, I got in on the Dolly 2 image AI tool. I would say within the next three years, graphics design and art in general is probably not going to be human-based. It's probably going to be run through a computer. Um, most white-collar jobs are actually going to be run through art, through AIs. So the first step right now is we're creating an asynchronous kind of process by which this proof of work is getting done. What are you, you know, what's the quality of your work and how fast are you taking, how much time are you taking to be able to do it? Um, but right now it's run primarily through humans. I think the next stage will be the majority of that work handled through artificial intelligence. Uh, and then after that domino falls, then um, it almost kind of like when you look at the the way that an organization is set up, particularly a startup, when you're the founder of the company, you're doing everything. You're doing sales, marketing, engineering, blah, blah, blah. Then you start delegating sales and marketing and finance and engineering. And then you start to delegate the executive roles inside of that organization. Then you start to delegate the operations of that company. Then you start to delegate even managing that executive, that executive team inside of the organization. And then finally, you might even delegate the visionary position inside of that organization. And I think probably the future, even though it may be, it may be terrifying, um, but this is to me where it's going is the ability to be able to start and scale a remote company, the barrier to entry is just going to continue to get lower and lower and lower to a point in which anyone can really do it. And the biggest variable that's going to be holding anyone back is their creativity and the way that they can impact uh, the industry in a positive or a negative way. So if we're headed towards a, a mass automation uh, space in, in work, how do employees win? Like if somebody's listening to this right now, that's like, shit, how do I prepare for that in the next 10 years? What sort of advice would you have for them so that they would be, you know, where the puck is going, so to say? So over the next 10 years, I would suggest that you get very, very good at something that I call the portfolio technique. I don't know if you've seen the movie Taken with Liam Neeson. Yeah. Remember when he gets on the sure. phone, he's like, I have a very specific set of skills. I'm going to find you and kill you or uh -huh. whatever. 
I should really remember what it is because I've used it in a couple other podcasts. Uh, you need to get good at a very, very specific set of skills. And the more niche those skills can be, the better. So I'll give you an example. I have launched multiple eight-figure remote run SaaS businesses inside of primarily marketing and sales. So I can lead those types of companies and I can build those types of companies. When you think about someone who has that type of resume, you're probably boiling it down to under a thousand people on planet earth. Now, in if I were to try to find a job in New York, maybe there's only two people that are looking for those types of positions. But we're not in New York, we're in the global economy, we're in remote work now. So my, the ability to be able to work anywhere is, you know, now anyone can do it. So there might be 10,000 people that are looking for those 1,000 positions, and it gives you a huge advantage in the marketplace. So get very, very specific. So if I'm saying like, hey, I'm, you know, I have five years of, uh, I don't know, some type of programming language. Um, say instead, I have five years of front-end development doing this in this particular type of industry with these particular types of people, um, building these types of prototypes. Get very, very specific at what you can do. And it's just the, the incorrect premise that you're, you're only looking for a job in New York or San Francisco or LA. I mean, that's... That's 2020, 2019 thinking. You need to think like 2022, which is, hey, I can find a job anywhere on planet Earth, so I better get as specific as possible. Yeah, that's so I have this this thesis that if you imagine, you know, if you have like three parts of employment and on one side you have like outsourcing automation and in the middle, you have like what's called like the regular nine to five job that outsourcing on one hand and automation on the other are going to squeeze that nine to five job to the point where there's like almost none of them left and what the the real winning employment part there is going to be some sort of like freelancing where you know as like uh, uh Naval talks about you know like you're going to hunt like a lion and not like you know work work like a lion not like a cow right where it's going to be a lot easier for you to do that that sort of thing where you do a project and you're very specific skill base and then you go and you chill out and then you do it again and, and so on and so forth as opposed to having a nine to five like f from my point of view this sort of it's almost like a type of freelancing is going to be the way of work of the future i would agree with that as it applies to the digital economy i mean one of the counterpoints to it is get a job that you can only do synchronously because there are lots of people that are still going to want those types of jobs. Like yeah. the last job to be automated is going to be a plumber or an electrician. Um, and those, I mean, the average plumber makes like 120 grand a year, right? Like it's not a bad yeah. position to be able to hold. Um, if I were going to do it over again, I have a, a cousin of mine that is a crane operator and he's pulling in like 160 and he's working six months out of the year at 160 grand and he gets to travel to different places and, you know, operate these cranes. So there is that argument, I think encapsulated inside of the digital economy. I absolutely agree that when you think about the future of work, it's going to be more project faced facing and that nine to five is really going to be, I mean, there's still going to be a need for that nine to five because there's going to be, there's going to need, you're going to need a project manager to be able to actually work with all of those freelancers. Yeah. But the freelancers are probably going to get paid way more um, than the yeah. person that's running, like to run a project. And that's going to be run by AIs, to be honest with you, in the next couple of years. Like, I think you're literally just going to have a, all right, hey, and I, I've been loving um, these Dolly 2. Um, image generators where I can literally type in, Hey, can I get a photo of Mitko in behind a yellow background with a whiteboard, but can I have him holding a machine gun and, you know, <laughs> um, and have a Batman cowl on and within two seconds, it just makes it for me photorealistic. Yeah. That kind of stuff. When people think about 
oh, what's going to get automated first? A lot of people thought it was going to be like these basic jobs, like people working at Walmart. It's not. It's going to actually be the really complicated jobs because those are the ones that have the that they cost the most, <laughs> right? Like yeah. if, I, if I'm going to try to replace a $20,000 worker or a $200,000 worker, you better bet that I'm going to try to replace the $200,000 worker first. Yeah, I actually tried to use that for a sales page, right? I tried to come up with all the imagery on the sales page through one of those image generators, and it was it wasn't great, but it was decent. Uh, it was it was decent. I mean, and we're talking about iteration one, right? Like by right, iteration exactly. six, this thing is going to be yeah. super easy. For sure, for sure. And I actually agree with you in terms of like the the synchronous versus asynchronous, where you almost the places to be is going to be on either end of the extremes, right? Because especially as we're seeing um, a lot of manufacturing pulling out of China post COVID and that rebirth ha happening in the Americas, like those are really great jobs to have right now in terms of like, if you're like, hey, remote work's not my thing. I really want to go to, you know, do something with my hands. It's a phenomenal time to do that. And I was actually just reading a report of a construction company in Chicago that obviously construction, like you're not doing that remotely, you know, other people are having to you know go in on the work sites but they pulled their entire back office and made them all remote and were able to reduce their costs because now their entire back office operations are not in chicago they're in like you know outside of you know pennsylvania or alabama or whatever and they've been able to expand a lot quicker because when your back office is remote all you need to do is just hire you know the the on place workers from wherever you need them to do and the back office is there to help no matter where they are so i think that's actually a really interesting industry industries that are not remote friendly but where you can take the back office remote is is a very interesting opportunity mm -hmm. yeah i've interviewed quite a few construction companies that are taking their back offices remote and it's an incredible i mean right now that industry is going through a huge transition because you can reduce your your cost of manufacturing by 20% just by removing your back office staff and having them not located in New York as an example, but having them located in, you know, Indianapolis. Um, and it's, it's just that kind of stuff. We haven't even started yet. Like I think we're 10% of the way in on that industry. So it's going to be very exciting to be able to see that pop up over the next couple of years. I think within the next three years, We'll probably see right now we're sitting at about 35% of the U.S. workforce working remotely. Within the next five years, I would probably say we'll be back up to about 50%. Um, salinity point is 67% based off of uh, very well, well, well repeated. What do you mean by that salinity point? So maximum amount of remote work positions that are available in terms of a percentage of the population. McKinsey did a huge report on it, and they said about 67% of the U.S. workforce can currently work remotely. And that's with the assumptions of all of the, um, effectively, you know, like someone needs to stock the shelves still today, but that will get automated, um, within the next five years. And I think ironically, this, uh, great resignation is only reinforcing that, right? Like the demand is so huge to be able to say, I've had, um, my wife runs a network of mermaid schools throughout North America and Europe. Mermaid schools? Yeah. So you put on a mermaid tail and you swim in a pool with like a mermaid tail. Oh, uh, God, I got it. I know what you're talking about. And so she runs dozens of these locations and her ability to be able to find staff has completely imploded in the last 12 months just because she can't find that labor effectively. It's much, much harder. Um, and I'm sure that, you know, the Walmarts and the Costco's of the world are going through those same problems. Um, and even just the general laborers of the world, you know, they, they, they have a lot more options than they had before. So there's going to be a lot more pressure. And I'm sure it's already happening right now where a lot of those positions will be replaced within the next three years. Yeah. It's, I think it's like, it's both a very exciting time to be alive and working, but it can also be like a really scary time for some people. I mean, you know, it's like, if, I don't want to BS not, people. We, like, <laughs> so my perspective is like, I could tell you that that's not going to happen, but that would not prepare you right. for life. Right. I have a two and a half year old daughter. Um, 
I need to tell her the truth. And sometimes that truth is scary because you need to prepare her for life. And I'm yeah. telling you right now, you know, if you think that you're going to be a cashier for the next 40 years, that's not going to happen. Uh, if you think that you're going to be an accountant for the next 40 years, that's not going to happen. That's the first thing that AIs are replacing right now. Um, uh, my accountant is effectively a customer support rep uh, for me, right? Like, okay, Liam, you got to pay this much tax and this is what you're doing and all this kind of stuff. But the vast majority of this stuff is now automated. Uh, so, yeah. you know, these are industries that you have to think to yourself, okay, am I customer facing? Am I front of office? Those jobs are probably still going to exist because you're going to need that to be able to make sure that I don't freak out as an example, when I say I owe this much to the IRS, um, <clears throat> you know, you need to calm me down and there's value in that. But all of the stuff that's back office, I mean, I would also say probably within the next five years, we will not be, there will still be engineers, but those engineers will literally just be describing an application. Like I would like yeah. a project management system that does this, 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 and this, and, you know, and then it will just create that code um, automatically. And then I can edit that code up a little bit to see, you know, kind of sand off the edges and we're up and running. So it's a very exciting future, but that future can sometimes be terrifying as well. Yeah. There was like this, um, I remember somebody saying once that one of the best skills to have is the ability to communicate with computers because the same way where everybody almost needs to have now, like if you don't have some computer use ability, you like, what do you like, what do you do for, for a job? Right? Like it's almost like necessary and you're almost going to need something like that in terms of like how to communicate with a computer and tell it what to do for like the next economy. And it's interesting because at first when I heard that, I was like, Oh, that means I'm gonna have to like learn at least some coding, and that has completely changed. Like the statement is still true, but the communication method has changed, right? Like now, like you're saying, like you need to be almost able to describe this in such a way that the computer provides for you what you want it to, right? Like it, the Dolly system will only produce what you have the ability to describe well. You need to get better at the written word. And that's one of the major tenets inside of asynchronous management is get better at communicating asynchronously. I would say until something like Neuralink pops up, which maybe that's going to pop up in the next five to 10 years, but there's probably going to be a moment in the next decade where there's going to be people that have a Neuralink-like device and people that don't. And the people that do will be able to enter a new tier of the economy and the people that don't will unfortunately be left behind. Mm, yeah. So I want to kind of, you know, heading towards wrapping up, I do want to ask about something that I'm very, very interested in. And I thought it was also very interesting that you mentioned it in the book, which is you have a chapter called the end of cities. I've been very fascinated post COVID with how a remote first economy and life affects the space that we occupy? How does it change cities? How does it change, um, you know, uh, how we design spaces and, and that sort of thing? So tell me a little bit about how do you think remote work changes that aspect? Like what happens to cities? Why do you, why did you name this chapter the end of cities? So it was a little bit hyperbolic. Uh, I don't think that cities are going to end. I live in a very nice city, Montreal, Canada, which I'm right in the downtown area. I'm a place, I'm in a place called the Plateau. Uh, and the reason why I'm here is not because it's a good place to work. It's actually a horrible place to work. I'm here because it's a good place to live. And I think the future of cities will no longer be how many jobs are available in this city, but is this a good place to live? Is this a good place to bring up children? Is this a good place to get access to coffee shops and co-working space and yoga studios? Is they're a good source of uh, food and water is, you know, is the tax base stable? Um, this is what city should be thinking about into the future. And to get very tactical with anyone that might be a mayor of a city that's thinking about this, I think there are two major things that you need to have in your city for it to succeed. You need a university and you need an airport that connects to a major hub. So a major hub would be something like O'Hare in Chicago, 
Newark, um, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Atlanta, um, and Toronto, Montreal. These are, you know, just examples in North America. But if you have daily flights to the, that particular hub, then remote workers will flock to that particular city. Um, Boulder is a example of a city that's doing this incredibly well. Montreal is another example of a city that's doing incredibly well. Sydney is another one. We talked before about cities like Lisbon and um, a Bali to a lesser degree. Um, the reason why I like Lisbon so much is there's business class direct flights out of Lisbon to almost every major city on planet Earth. Another really good one is Mexico City. Um, even though Istanbul is another good one, uh, I actually am looking to buy some property there because I think it's actually going to be a the the cost of inflation is going up quite a bit there. So it's a really good time to buy. Um, another one that people don't mention that often, which I actually think is going to become a huge hotspot is Cancun because there are the most direct flights out of Cancun than any other airport on planet Earth. So the ability to be able to actually go to different places is going to be a critical part of the new kind of cosmopolitan class, which I refer to as digital nomads. Um, I actually yeah. think there's like, there were three major epochs of digital nomadism. There was epoch number I think one. The same. Oh, okay. I'll go through so my interpretation yeah. and maybe, maybe yeah, you agree yeah. or disagree with mine. So epoch one was computer engineers. They're all paid like $100,000, $150,000 per year. They're doing their thing and they are a very small community, but it's mostly engineers. Epoch two is the age of the Instagram digital nomad. Um, to a lesser degree, there was a lot of like, I'm a digital nomad and what I actually, how I actually make money is selling the course and the information to become a digital yes. nomad, which ethically I have a little bit of an issue with because they're not actually showing people how to do it effectively. But the average cost of your digital nomad went down to $15,500, um, which from 120,000 to 15,000, like people were doing social media agencies, you know, kind of yeah. working a little bit, doing their projects, but they had enough to live. Right. Um, and then the third epoch, which I'm seeing right now, is the age of the rich, dumb nomad. And so I'll give you a perfect example. About three months after COVID started, I had a buddy of mine that lives in San Francisco and he works for a tech company. He's a VP in that tech company, makes almost half a million dollars a year. If I named the tech company, you would know exactly what company this is. And he's like, dude, like, how much can you actually get a place for in Bali? And I was like, oh, like two grand can get you like a four bedroom place with like, you know, a cleaner to come in every two days. And he's like, what are you talking about? I'm paying $8,000 for a one bedroom apartment in the city. And the next week he left. He actually snuck into Bali because you can literally just grease a couple palms <laughs> and you can get in because the, they weren't, you know, it was a complete lockdown. Uh, I think he flew private actually to be able to get in. And um, then about a year later, they had him come back once a month to be able to make sure that they're clearly defining tax residency. So this is a big problem. And actually, I think this is the yeah. biggest next challenge for digital nomadism is tax residency, to be completely honest with you. I know that that's a really boring subject that no one wants to hear about, but it is how- no, but it's, it's, it's real. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, it is that like, so if you're in the state of California, there's a, there's a court case that's happening right now. Um, there was a massive call center in California around Los Angeles and had thousands of reps. They all went remote. And then um, a whole bunch of reps started quote unquote, moving to Texas. And they weren't moving to Texas. They just had their PO, PO boxes set up in Texas because they were committing tax fraud because California has a state tax of 12% and Texas has no state tax. And so the IRS and the state of California went after the company. And the company is now possibly on the lam for hundreds of millions of dollars uh, because of this, this tax issue. That company is back in an office. They will never go remote because they've they've licked their wounds with regards to this big problem. When you think about corporate America, it's not, we don't need more digital nomad, you know, 
Instagram, hey, I'm living this amazing lifestyle. It's actually convincing the Fortune 500 CEO saying, hey, I know that you want your staff to be able to work remotely. I know that they're screaming for it. And I know you can't do it because of tax residency issues. Let me show you how to actually fix that problem so that you can empower your people to be able to work outside of the office. There are a couple of companies that have done it. Airbnb is doing it. Facebook is doing it. Um, but there are a lot of other companies where, you know, if you look at the fine print, they'll say, oh, we're an- announcing remote work. But you must show up one day a week or one day a month because it's tax residency. Well, this is well, this is why companies like Deal and Remote went from zero to like massive valuations very, very quickly because, it, you know, they're kind of fusing that that need. And like, it's actually like, I just kind of, like came up with this is COVID was the best thing for digital nomadism as like a movement, but it was actually the worst thing for digital nomads because they like, we were kind of all doing some back alley sketchy stuff to get around the bureaucracies. And it was fine because there were so few of us that for the most part, it didn't really make sense for the governments to, to be interested but now you got a whole bunch more and governments are becoming interested. So they are going after these sort of like situations that in the past just wouldn't have been profitable for the countries to do. Yeah, no, I, I, you're, you hit the nail on the head. I think the other part of this, which is also quite interesting, is Epoch 2 digital nomads are getting priced out of the market. When you're making $15,000 a year versus a guy that rolls up and is making $500,000, like my buddy's running Changu right now. Like he can do whatever he wants because he's just like, listen, I've got this epic place. Oh, this place is $15,000 a month. Yeah. But before you moved in, it was 5,000. He doesn't care, right? Like he's, he's loving what he's doing. And so I think that, um, even if you look at the cost of real estate right now, and some of those Southeast Asian digital nomad hubs, they're going through the roof. I could bet you, I don't have the data in front of me. I did have it for Chenggu. Chenggu is like tripled in price in the last like year and a half. Um, I bet you Chiang Mai has got the same type of of flow happening. Uh, Probably places in the Philippines are going through the roof. Like we're at a point now where um, I actually, during COVID, ended up investing in some co-working spaces when they were like, 20 cents on the dollar. They're doing a lot better now because my thesis was, well, this is eventually going to drop. This is eventually going to come back in 10 X fundamentally. Um, so I, I think that we're, we're seeing that third generation of digital nomads come in and trash everything, um, for the other generation where it's not going to be affordable for them anymore. But then to your point, the tax residency issue is, a scary problem because when I, you know, back in 2019, I'd look around the room and I'd be like, man, the majority of you guys are not tax compliant at all. Like, <laughs> and it's even scarier though, because like the governments don't actually know what's going on. Like I had, uh, Lauren Razavi from, uh, Plumia. I don't know if you're familiar with Plumia, yeah, but they're a safety we were, wings was, company, right? Yeah, 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 that's right. They're kind of trying to do what they're calling the Nomad Border Pass. So they're working with like their plan is to have uh, an actual digital nomad visa, not a citizenship play, which would be that you'd be able to like once you get this pass, you would get access to like 10 different countries for three months at a time. Right. So you'd get like one, you know, two birds with one stone kind of thing. But the interesting thing that she said is. It's crazy just how much of a base level we need to start the conversation at when we go in to speak with these government representatives because they have no idea what a digital nomad is. They don't know anything about what's happening, and it's scary that there are these sort of tax issues happening, and yet the government representatives don't even have a base level understanding of what's going on, right? Because those are the people that are going to be passing the laws. Mm, yeah, yeah. I think when you think about um, when I think about projects like Plumia, and I love the Safety Wing guys. They've they sponsored yeah. Running Remote multiple times. They they, they sponsor this podcast. There so we go. So much. And and, <laughs> and I actually use their product. Um, I just used their product about three months ago. Um, fantastic experience. But the I actually think it needs to be solved through the digital nomad visa route. The issue that I have with the Plumia program is. At the end of the day, the politically incorrect thing that everyone has to come to 
grips with is if you have a first world passport, you can do whatever you want. And if you have a passport from a developing country, like we have team members in 43 different countries all over the world. We're doing our next team retreat in Dubai. Why Dubai? Because they let anyone in. Um, there are so many countries where it's like, oh, we can't let these seven countries in. Like we've got, you know, 18 people that we can't let in to our team retreat just because they don't like, uh, Indonesia is a direct call out to them, which is super frustrating. Uh, we have some trans, um, team members and they have an M on their passport, but they're currently an F. And they can't have that changed as an example. That's a very serious problem in Indonesia and you can get into a lot of trouble. Yeah. So they're terrified to even go. That was a team yep. retreat that we did a couple of years ago. So like the infrastructure, I actually think it needs to happen on a country by country basis, uh, which I think Plumia is helping with. But at the end of the day, it needs to be a digital nomad visa where they are saying, we're not going to do we're not going to have any tax responsibilities placed upon you in any way whatsoever, not only for yourself as an individual, but any of the corporations um, that you might be yeah. a major shareholder in. And that's the actual part that no one really pays attention to because they are going after people. I have a friend of mine um, and one country located in Europe is going after them for about a hundred million dollars uh, and they won't win, but like, yeah, it's it's all about, um, oh, well, all of these team members spent more than three months in your country and they were making business decisions in our country and yeah. you owe taxes. Well, and I think that's what the long term Plumia plan is, is right, is they say, like, build the first country on the Internet, which sounds kind of woo woo, but it does make sense in terms of like, hey, if we have this one team member who was unfortunately born in a country that doesn't give them a lot of opportunity and it's hard for them to get citizenship in another country can we serve as far as I understand their plan as a middle ground, right? Where you come into here so that then you can get into the other places, uh, which I think makes a lot of sense, right? Uh, yeah. Is to I think the delivery, if I was in their marketing department um, and I've been on their podcast, I think two or three times. Uh, so I'm not saying any, I, I really like what they're doing, but my critique would be yeah. forget about creating a different country because that gets a lot of countries nervous. Like I couldn't show up on a Plumia passport. They'd be like, get the fuck out of here. What do you mean Plumia passport? W where are you from? Um, like show me your real passport, right? Uh, yeah. What they should be fighting for is how to build standardized digital nomad visas across every single country on planet yeah. earth. So totally there's a built-in system where I show up, Oh, I need a digital nomad visa. Yeah, dude, it costs you a grand. Can you prove that you made more than 50 grand last year? Yep. Here you go. Yeah. Stamp. Boom. You're out. You know, like that's the kind of, that's the future. That's incredibly exciting yeah, because I agree. then it can expand the, the cities being a nice place to live on a global scale, um, which I'm very, very excited about. I think that yeah. once we have this freedom of movement, you'll have places like Lisbon that will, you know, the, the, the amount of homes in, um, um, like the empty homes in Lisbon, it's like 22%. And uh, it, it, like you just go down the streets and there's just empty houses everywhere. And to a degree, that's because the city became a lot less affordable um, due in part to digital nomadism. But a lot, of these, a lot of these houses are rotting. And if you can make those investments, like I think that Lisbon be could become an international city where it's just like, yeah, it's Portuguese, but, you know, you've got such an amazing, um, maybe I just want everywhere to feel like Canada because I'm Canadian. <laughs> We're a very multicultural society where yeah. it's like everyone has their own culture and interacts um, on an equal basis. You could have Canada everywhere, uh, which would be awesome for me. What a what a statement. That's what that's what we all want to hear is Canada, Canada everywhere. I'm with you on that. Um but yeah, and I think another shout out to someone else who's working in this and I think doing a really good job is actually Gonzalo Hall where, you know, he's kind of literally boots on the ground in this in this space, like building digital nomad villages from scratch. And I think the interesting play there is that when a country gets a taste of that, 
then they say, okay, how do we build the rest of that infrastructure? And so I think that that's very interesting um, uh, as well. Um, but Liam, I want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast. This has been uh, so much fun. Uh, I'm super excited about the book. We should not wait 140 episodes to have you back on. Uh, but before we kind of sign off, can you please let people know where can they get the book? Uh, I'm assuming Amazon. And also, if you do get it from Amazon, leave a five-star review yeah. so that we can get that <laughs> review count up. And then, uh, Liam, also, where uh, can people connect with you online? Sure. So runningremotebook.com is a really great spot. Uh, and runningremote.com, obviously, that's where you can check out the book and the conference. And if you can't afford the book or the conference, the book is 22 bucks. Um, my publisher actually lowered the price from 30 to 22, which is awesome. So it's super affordable. But if you can't afford that, then uh, go to youtube.com slash running remote. We have all of our talks up there for free that come from the running remote conference. So if you want a masterclass on how to be able to work remotely, it's right there. Perfect. Uh, well, Liam, thank you so much, man. This has been uh, a ton of fun. 